Welcome to the Why Did You Read That podcast with me, Peter, and... And me, Megan. Yeah. I was like, should I say, and you, and then you say Megan, or... You know, it it all works. We, really, we get there in the end. We do. We need to get an introduction down. <laughs> I, uh, I assume, the speaking of introductions, that you've got a, a joke to ease us all in. Of course I have a joke. <laughs> okay. Are you ready for my joke? I, I guess so, yeah. Okay. Why can't you run in a campground? I don't know. You can only ran because it's past tense. Oh, man. That is a rough one. No, that's great. That's a... (laughs) I say that's a rough one, but I just remembered that I often try to use a version of that joke where I say something about how camping is really intense. Mm, Yeah. And I think mine's actually worse than that one. So I I think I passed judgment too fast. (laughs) You know how sometimes when you recognize something that you do, it's much worse because yeah. you're like, oh, no, yeah. I do that. This is horrible. It, but you know what? I'm telling you that it's not. It's fine. It's, in <laughs> fact, funny. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, well, welcome, everybody. So uh, normally the format goes like this. I pick four books. Megan picks four books. Mm-hmm. Um, I pick two of Megan's books for her to talk about. She picks two of mine. And then we just briefly mention the other books because, I mean, why not? Yeah. Um, We're shaking it up, though. That's right. We're changing the game. Um, The way it's going to work this time, so the library has a service called the Personalized Reading List Service, Mm -hmm. um, PRL. Yeah. And uh, basically, you can get online. Well, I don't know why I'm talking about th- You're like the queen of this. And I'm like, let me explain how it works. <laughs> no, you should do it because I'm too familiar with it. I can't see the forest anymore. So you, the way it works is like uh, you get online, you fill out a little form, which when I say that, I feel like 90% of people are like, okay, never mind. Because <laughs> filling out, how many forms have you filled out online? It, but this is like not, not a bad long. one. No, I was thinking about how to describe how long it was. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if you are a coffee drinker and you started drinking a cup of coffee when you did this, you'd maybe be a third of the way through by the time you were done. Maybe. Well, it it really can take as long or as little time as you put into it. The more time you put into it, the better our suggestions will be. Yep. But uh, you can do it very quickly if you're just looking for, you know, a quick 10. Or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. And it's not like a a boring survey or something. Right. It's like asking about you, which is everybody's favorite topic, right? Yeah. Is themselves. But um, it's like books that you've disliked, books that you've liked. We'll go through one in a second here and you'll sure. kind of see. But um, so what we decided to do for this episode and to kind of show you like how the PRL works, maybe encourage you to fill one out and to um, just kind of give you some knowledge some back-end knowledge here is like we had someone fill out a prl Mm -hmm. and with their consent we're going to talk about um recommendations that we came up with based on what this person filled out yes and um so we came up with eight total recommendations and she picked four two of each of ours Mm -hmm. and so those are the ones we're going to talk about yes and then we'll just briefly mention the others yeah so it's kind of the same end result here you'll still get your eight exactly but we're not going to pick the four. Yeah. So it's actually a little better because for once yeah. <laughs> we're not picking yeah. our own stuff. Well, and, and we can't um, we can't sabotage each other by no. picking what we think are the worst recommendations. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. as is always true with us, this has turned into a competition. This has become very competitive. Yeah. It, it started out a little competitive, but I kind of gave up immediately because Megan's really good at this. So then – but then I uh, – I, Worked up some courage and have done more trash yeah. talking. <laughs> I was going to say, I've been getting some smack talk. Yeah. My feelings are a little hurt. It took me back to like fourth grade basketball, <laughs> which I was bad at, but I was okay at the trash talk element. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not often in uh, library work that trash talk is like a, yeah. a preferred, what do they call that? A preferred? marketable skill? Yeah. <laughs> But I've been enjoying the smack time. I'm like, finally, finally, these skills I've worked on, these yeah. life skills come to play. <laughs> yeah. It it caught me a little off guard. I was expecting some mild trash talking and then I got like a full on challenge. I went for it. Yeah. Yep. It was good. 
Well, it was good for you. It hurt my feelings. Well, kind of the goal. Well, it worked. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the goal of trash talk. <laughs> so, okay. I think we can start. I'll go through the PRL pretty quickly. Sure. Go a little more slowly through the things that uh, she requested. Mm -hmm. So that way everybody kind of sees. And then we'll go through our books and we'll talk a little bit about those books so that you, the listeners, might be interested. And also um, talk just a little bit about why we picked those books for this request. Right. It's a little how the sausage gets made. Exactly. But less gross. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so first there's just demographic info, like your name, your zip code, stuff like that. That's mostly in touch with you? Yeah, that's mostly so it's like, well, we did this whole thing. How do you see what we found? Um, Next is the reading level you're interested in, and that's kind of like an adult or teen thing. There's also a a children's, there's a Mm -hmm. completely separate thing. Yeah, Um, and Spanish. And Spanish. So when you go to the forum, you go to the same one online regardless of your your demographic there. And as you fill it out, it kind of, the form changes to accommodate whichever. Um, Next, it asks if you prefer reading fiction, nonfiction, or both. Uh Then we've got, um, if you want any specific formats, like you can select eBooks or audio books or whatever. Audio eBooks. Audio eBooks. Yeah. If you're like, (laughs) I want an eBook or I want audio, but no CDs, large print. (laughs) So this is a really nice feature if you're somebody who's like, I only read on my Kindle, or if you're like, I can only do audiobooks or whatever. Right. But, you know, it can be something that you are able to access, or it can just be a preference. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Next, there's a big long list of basically genres, I guess. There's some types, things like that. Formats and subjects and stuff. Yeah, and you can check all the ones that you're interested in. Um, So she checked adventure, award winners, bestsellers, biography, autobiography, or memoir, humor, literary fiction, mystery, relationship fiction, science, suspense, and true crime. Mm -hmm. So that was a pretty uh, healthy number of (laughs) categories. There's also an other category. So if we didn't hit something that you're interested in or if you're looking for something very specific, you can tell us what that is. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of, well, we've talked about bizarro literature on Mm -hmm. here. And that's a little more niche, but check yeah, it. Put it in other. short stories or, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. We'll it, try. It's kind of nice. I think what's part of what's nice about filling this out is you do get like prompted to, you know, there are certain, you don't have to just come out up with everything out of nowhere. Yeah. The dreaded question, what kind of books do you like to read? Yeah. And, and, and like, deer Ugh. in the headlights. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know. I work in a library and I'm still like. If someone says, oh, what's the last good book you read? I'm like, uh. (laughs) Yeah. I had someone yesterday ask me for help finding historical fiction, and my brain came back with, you don't read books. (laughs) (laughs) 404, not found. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Next is, please list some favorite books and authors. Feel free to tell us why you like them. The more we know about your reading taste, the better our suggestions will be. Um, So some people fill out very, very little, some people more. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's a little easier if you give us a little more information, sure. but you know, there's no like, uh, Hey, you haven't filled in 500 words yet. Yeah. Like you can't turn this in. Right. Honestly, just a list of three of your favorite authors would get us where we're going. Um, yeah. it might not be as good as if you gave a, if you told us exactly why or what titles, but we'll be able to hopefully find something you would enjoy. Yeah. Chances are we'll get there. Yeah. All right, here's what she put. I really like documentaries and learning about individual experiences. I loved, that's in all caps. All caps. Into Thin Air by John Krakauer, and I'm in the middle of The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson and enjoying it. I frequently add books that are sociological studies or memoirs slash biographies to my to-read list, e.g. The New Jim Crow, Bad Blood, Hidden Valley Road, and books by Helen Thorpe. I like suspense slash mystery as well and really jumped on that bandwagon when books like The Girl on the Train, The Woman in Cabin 10, and Gone Girl were popular, all of which I read and liked. TV shows and movies I like in a similar vein are Lost, The Prestige, Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman, and Identity, the John Cusack movie. I enjoy some dystopian slash fantasy books like The Gracier and Ready Player One, but generally don't choose them as things to read. I prefer books with more realistic elements to them and don't like to have to recreate a whole world in my mind. I'm a visual reader and often have pictures in my brain of the settings and people. 
Another book I absolutely loved was Tell the Wolves I'm Home. I was able to develop deep empathy with the characters and appreciated a fictional story that allowed me a glimpse into another's experience whose identities differ than my own. An author I like but haven't read in a long time is Emily Giffen. I like that her books are contemporary and her characters are typically people I would identify with in some way. Finally, I'm really intrigued when I find a book that follows a couple storylines and each chapter alternates writing about a specific character or that character is narrating a chapter. I find that very interesting and it tends to quicken the pace of the book as well as make it easy to put down at a good stopping point. P.S. I don't mind, quote, guy books. I made it partway through The Sisters Brothers and really liked the book. Work happened, so I didn't finish reading it, but really want to. I recently had a craving to read a Western, which is super weird because I wouldn't consider myself a fan of that genre. <laughs> but I also really liked the show Longmire, never read any of the books, so maybe I am a fan, question <laughs> mark? Just a couple quick things on this. Um, this is a pretty thorough one. That's a lot of information. Yeah. Lots of good detailed information. Yes. But uh, don't feel pressured, you know, like right. if you want to do bullet points too, like you yeah. don't have to do a whole narrative if you don't want to. We see everything from I really like historical mysteries and that's all mm -hmm. to something like this, which is a lot of very detailed information. Yeah, definitely. Um, also, I liked this reminded me of we did like a, a quick video commercial a couple years ago because we had a bunch of giveaway books. Yeah. And it was The Girl on the Train, The Woman in Cabin 10, Gone Girl. And we had a whole rack of books that were like the girl, the woman, the whatever. <laughs> like yeah. The girl with the dragon tattoo. Is yeah. That... Thrillers can only uh, apparently feature girls and or women. I... <laughs> or at least during that phase of publishing. I started to wonder if that phase of publishing, they were just like, this doesn't even have a woman in it, yeah. but just put it in the title. Who cares? It a lot. There's a big book and then all of a sudden everyone's jumping on that train. They're like, we got to have girl in the title. I know. I was like, <laughs> whatever. I, I don't know if, I don't know if the idea is to like make people associate it with the other or if they're like, people want to be confused and won't know which one they're getting. Well, if you think about like Disney movies and then there are always those like subpar animation studios oh, yeah. that make the little mermaid kind of looks like that one just yes. so that like your clueless older relatives might just pick it up thinking that it's the disney one yep i my favorite of those was back in the blockbuster days you know transformers was out and next to it was a huge wall of transmorphers exactly <laughs> and the cover was you know just a hair shy of copyright actionable yep. <laughs> is how i would describe that is the art exactly style. what i mean <laughs> All right. Um, now tell us about some books or authors that you have disliked and why. I always like this part because mm -hmm. I feel like this is where people tend to get passionate. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's more important, I think, to not step into the traps that people haven't liked before. So if you know where they are, they're yeah. easier to avoid. Yeah. And, you know, like something else I was going to say about the previous part is, you know, she was saying, I don't mind, quote, guy books, you know, and when people fill these out too, don't don't feel like ashamed of you know oh, yeah. what you do and don't like, and don't worry about saying like, don't worry about saying like I hated uh, some of mice and men. Right. You know what I mean? It's like this isn't your high school English teacher. We're not going to send you an email that's like, well, here's what you should read then of mice and men again <laughs> until you appreciate it. <laughs> Like, yeah, we're not looking to give you homework assignments or make your make you quote unquote smarter. No, like our entire purpose is to bring you joy in your reading. That's that's our goal. Yeah, we're trying to conform and give you things you like, not mm -hmm. change your taste. Right. You know, that's not the unless that's what you want, which would be a, sure. a tough one. We have had people say like, I'm looking to you know find get better familiarity with classic literature, and we go through and we find some things from the canon, quote unquote that might help them do that. Like, we'll do whatever you're looking for. Exactly. We're not going to shame you. No. All right. So here's some dislikes and why. I hated Miller's Valley and all I caps. really turn off. Yeah, all caps again. <laughs> <laughs> we see a lot more caps lock in the hated <laughs> category. I hated Miller's Valley and I'm really turned off by Anna Quinlan from that experience. The book felt very monotone and like I was reading the narrator's boring diary. The kind of diary a grandparent writes in about the weather or what was cheap at the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> it 
The synopsis of the book hooked me, and I thought family secrets would be revealed, causing upheaval and emotions. No. None of that happened, and I was so disappointed since I saw potential for intriguing storylines that weren't actualized. Isn't that the worst? Oof. Yeah. When you're like, here's the missed opportunity. Yeah. Here's what I would have liked to see, and it was so close. I went to a writing workshop once, and that's how the facilitator talked about stories. Mm-hmm. They're like, here are the missed opportunities. And it was like a dagger. Yeah. I know it was meant to be like softer. And I was like, no, it's worse. I kind of just wish you said it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I also disliked Would We Believed in Mermaids by Barbara O'Neill for similar reasons to Miller's Valley. There was a mystery subplot that was never expanded on, which I was curious to read more of. I also didn't feel like the character chemistry was there. I did not feel any empathy or connection to the main character or the main narrator, Kit. I don't like books that are highly sexual, ahem, no thank you, Fifty Shades series. (laughs) I'm more interested in the interpersonal relationships and effects characters' actions have on their lives and the outcomes. Not reading pages and pages about Make Out Party USA between people. (laughs) Also, I need a book to wrap up, spend time on that wrap up, and have a conclusion. I remember finishing the Hunger Games series at 2am and was so disappointed and couldn't sleep. The final book felt rushed, I had trouble following the final action slash plot, and there were some components that felt very unresolved to me. I also just finished watching the TV show Kim's Convenience and felt the same way. It just ended. That's unsatisfying to me to just leave characters at whatever point they're at in their lives. I want whatever the book is about slash the main plot to have some kind of closure, good or bad. By the way, everything else about Kim's Convenience was amazing, such a good show. (laughs) Okay, next we have a thing that's sort of a breakdown for content, I guess. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that can make or break a story. Let us know about your likes and dislikes. And there are three categories, coarse language, sexual content, and violence. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of rate them on a scale, I think, from like does not matter to like absolutely avoid. And then there's kind of a middle option of meh. Uh, well, I think actually there's a, a, an, I like it, like, oh, you're right. Yeah. Give me, give me all of the intense content. There's a, I don't care either way. And there's a, please don't. And so then there's those three. She said, doesn't matter for all three. Right. So, uh, but yeah, that's another one. Don't worry about being ashamed. Like right. when I watch horror movies, I like the gore. You I'm want not some heads lie. to roll? I do. Fair. <laughs> I, you know, when I see, uh. I have a ranking in my mind of, like, best exploding heads in horror movies. Do you really? Yeah. We'll have to compare notes. Scanners is number one. (laughs) Far and away. (laughs) But uh, Dawn of the Dead has a pretty good one, too. Is there anything else you're in the mood for or you would like us to avoid? She just noted that this was for this podcast. Right. But so that's that's just kind of a catch-all of, like... Yeah, if you wanted to say, like... I was reading this one series, and I, this is the last book I read. I'm curious if there are any others after that. We could do that research for you. Yep. Or, like, you can put things in here, too, because, for example, you know, someone can fill this out for their book club. Right. So you're like, our book club needs new picks, so I'm kind of doing this as, like, a, a melding of all of our tastes. Mm-hmm. So that can help us, you know, understand what's going right. on. Or um, if you have, like, a reading project going on, like, maybe you're like, I'm going to read all women in sci-fi this year, something like that. Sure. Then it's like, all right, that helps us. Not give you things you're not looking for. <laughs> give you not 10 books that you're like, none of these qualify. <laughs> so that's basically, that is her list. So we each picked four, mm-hmm. and then she picked two of our four. Do you want to go first? Sure. I'm going to go over all four. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So the first book I picked um, with her in mind was Heartland, A Memoir of Working Hard and Being Broke in the Richest Country on Earth by Sarah Smarsh. And I picked it because she, she, in the nonfiction that she listed, she talks about wanting to get perspectives, new perspectives, or a glimpse into somebody's life, develop empathy for someone who's not like her. So this is um, a memoir of someone who grew up poor in a small Kansas town in the 80s and 90s, and uh, eventually worked her way out of that life, but very much understands it because it is, you know, historically her family for generations lived poor. And uh, I thought that might appeal to her. The second book I picked was Savage Country by Robert Olmsted. 
And I picked that because she said she had a hankering for a Western. And so I was looking for a Western that might uh, scratch that itch. And so this is kind of a literary Western. It's realistic and gritty and um, has like a vibrant setting. And I uh, thought that it might appeal. The third one I picked is a book called Leonard and Hungry Paul by Ronan Hessian. And I picked that because she focuses a lot on character in the description when she was asking for books that she likes. Um, and she talks about wanting to connect to people and develop empathy. And that is, I think, where this book shines. It is uh, about two grown men who never left home. They still live at home. They have very close relationships with their families, and they're kind of out of step with at least American regular like popular culture and society. They're seen as kind of outliers or maybe a bit strange, but they're both um, lovely, good people who are, you know, trying to live their best lives. And so it's a, a bit unusual. You also don't see a lot of middle-aged men as like stars, like your average dude kind of book. So mm. I thought that that might be one that she'd be interested in. And then my fourth pick was Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots. This was my out of left field one a little bit. I always like to pull something that might be a bit of a stretch. This is um, kind of realistic sci-fi, if that's a thing. It's uh, superhero culture. So the world of this book, there are superheroes and supervillains and supervillains need staff. So the main character, Anna, she is a temp uh, worker for supervillains. She does a lot of data entry, <laughs> a lot of light <laughs> office work. And uh, one day she gets um, asked by the supervillain Electric Eel to basically go to a meeting and look uh, menacing, stand behind him and look threatening. And when a, a superhero shows up, she gets caught in the crossfire and gets terribly injured and she's out of work and starts researching the effect that superheroes have on people's health and well-being and how much they cost society. <laughs> um, so a uh, little bit quirky and offbeat, but a lot of fun. So those are my four. Sounds pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty solid. Bring it uh, on, Peter. What do you got? Well... Okay, I uh, have one called The Long Walk by Brian Kastner. Mm -hmm. I think of this as uh, the short version is like The Hurt Locker, but maybe a little bit more in depth and less, a little less like an action movie because that is through and through an action movie <laughs> until the last like 10 minutes. I kind of picked that one because I thought, you know, the, the memoir thing, um, the sort of she kind of talked a little bit about like micro history, maybe personal mm -hmm. histories, and also the guy uh, book thing. Sure. I picked one called The Meadow by James Galvin. That one to me is kind of like a combo of a Western, a memoir, and is also kind of a guy book, but is like, I don't, it's one of the books that it seems pretty universally pleasing to a lot of people. Um, and it's kind of a more modern Western. It's about Thai siding Wyoming, which is pretty nearby um, northern Colorado, and how that is changing as the decades go by and becoming more, I was going to say more urban, but that's probably not totally accurate. But when we're talking about maybe several square miles where a handful of people live. Okay. He's, you know, um, the next one is called The Call by Yannick Murphy. That one's kind of that was probably my outside left field pick too. Yeah, it's always fun to kind of take one of those, you know, and yeah. kind of be like a reach title. Yeah, or you just kind of get a feeling like you're like maybe those are my favorite. Often, the call is about like a large animal vet, and the book has this structure where it's really short chapters, and it starts with you know the call and like what the call was that took the vet out of the house. So the book is kind of presented as this large animal vet's like diary of the uh, vet work they're doing. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, kind of meanders into other things that are happening and kind of does. So it kind of does like the world building she's talking about where it's not, you don't have to recreate an entire world from scratch mm -hmm. and it's a world that looks like ours, but it gives enough of those little details that it makes it feel very real. Okay. And it, it keeps you chugging along because it's like, 
if you're not real interested in one chapter, they're two pages, three pages. The last one's a book called Dear Everybody by Michael Kimball. I picked this one because it reminded me quite a bit of Tell the Wolves I'm Home and kind of that emotional closeness to a character. Um, basically, this one's like a book of letters from an unnamed narrator who is planning to commit suicide and is kind of writing letters to everyone in his life. Um, but this includes like family members and friends, but also includes like the Easter bunny and some other, you know, or like a restaurant mm -hmm. or something like that. The postman. Yeah. So it kind of is like a weird backwards way of hearing about a character. So those were my four picks. Okay. Um, do you want to start with and tell us a little bit more about one of your picks that she picked? <laughs> Okay. Peter Piper picked a peck of talking about picking books all day. Pickled peppers? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so I have to, first of all, say that I found this a very interesting experiment because I don't usually get to see the the reaction from people who get a list from us. Um, usually I send it out there and just hope that they got something that they were interested in. So it was very fun for me to be able to hear back from someone, uh, the ones that they were most interested in hearing more about. Mm -hmm. And I also have to admit I was a bit surprised. Yeah. <laughs> so the first one uh, that she picked that she wanted to hear more about was Savage Country by Robert Olmsted, the Western. So I'll talk a little bit more about why I picked it and what it's about, what it's like. So it's a gritty and realistic Western, um, which is something I thought would appeal to her. It's set in 1837 in Kansas, what is now Kansas. I assume it was some kind of territory at the time. And it features, the main character is Elizabeth. She's newly widowed. Her husband, uh, he ended up with tons of debt. He owned a ranch and got it into terrible, terrible debt and then committed suicide, leaving her, you know, with all of his problems, basically, which is not ever anyone's preferred place to be. Not cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So she is now responsible for um, saving, hopefully, the ranch, which is her home, and also the home for all of her hired hands. But she doesn't have a whole lot of options um, for how to earn the money to pay off these debts. So to try to salvage her life, um, she convinces her brother-in-law, Michael, uh, who was a Civil War veteran and also an experienced big game hunter, to come and help her follow through with her husband's crazy plan, basically, to do a buffalo hunt. So the idea is that a small group of hunter hunters, including Elizabeth and Michael, will cross what they call the deadline that marks the boundary between the settlers, Kansas, and Comanche lands. And they will go and try to hunt enough buffalo to sell and save the ranch while the Comanche are away in their winter lands before they get back, basically. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was um, it was funny you were mentioning, or I saw this on your list, and I was telling you earlier, like I had two Robert Olmsted books I was thinking about, mm -hmm. and then I went with The Meadow instead as my kind of westerny pick. But I was like, this close. Yeah. I had a different one, but it was like pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Olmsted went on a tear there, where he wrote like three or four really good westerny mm -hmm. books in a row like yeah if you're talking contemporary western writers he's a name that will definitely come up he's way up there yeah, yeah. he's pretty great he wrote a good memoir too mm -hmm. trying to remember what it's called now and eh, it doesn't matter yeah let's not let's not get into that let's not do the thing that where it's like i'm talking to my mom and she's like <laughs> trying to remember if I was at Target or Walmart. And I'm like, does it matter? I saw my neighbor. You know my neighbor. The one who, when you were five, remember when you went swimming? Yeah. And you're like, uh, yeah, fine. What's the, what are we talking about? Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that sounds like a really good one. Yeah. Um, it's kind of bleak, a little grim, unsentimental. There's, you know, especially when you're talking about, you know, American bison and their fate like the idea of this mass slaughter of a bunch of buffalo is, you know, it has a different effect now maybe reading about it, knowing knowing their fate. Yeah. Uh, and it also, um, I thought she might like it because it's very clear-eyed. Like it's not, it, it acknowledges the hardships that settlers faced in the American West without glorifying that um, and also acknowledging what happened to the people who were already here, mm -hmm. um, to the land that, you know, was taken over to things like the Buffalo. 
So um, it's a bit complex. Um, it's definitely challenging and thought provoking, but I, I think that it could be a match based on other things that she's liked. Yeah, I like I like uh, Robert Olmsted's books too because they have. I think the writing is really like clear. Yeah. But then he puts the characters in these pretty dire situations. Mm -hmm. Like he is definitely the king of like, I don't fall in love with my characters to a way I can't make them suffer. Because <laughs> he seems to have no problem with that. Yeah. I always admire that and hate it at the same time. Yeah. Like I like to feel like the author is in control and they're going to do to me what they plan on. <laughs> But also, like, I don't want them to. I know. You're like, oh, this is not. Well, just when you hear the the sort of summary and you're like, this does not sound like a good idea. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I read, a, I'm trying to remember what it was called, Comanche Moon? Is that what it's called? I'm not sure. There's a book about um, the Comanche. And it oh, was... is this the Quanah Parker book? Uh, I don't even remember. Okay. Because I read a book about Quanah Parker, who was like the last chief of the Comanche. Oh, uh, no. I, was... I can't remember what it was who wrote it or what the title was, but it was, uh, were your mom at the grocery store. I know, but I was definitely convinced by that book that the Comanche was not a group of people that I would yeah. want to fool with. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think we read different books, but we came to the same conclusion. <laughs> yeah, like that is, a, I would say a, a really bad idea. <laughs> the thing I walked away with from the book that I read, which, um, I think it's like under, a. Heart under a something moon. Yeah. That's, maybe we did read the maybe same we one. we did. Um, but the thing I walked away with, the thing that I will always remember, is that they were the most horsemanlike of, of all of the Western tribes, to the extent where women had a lot of miscarriages because they were always on horseback, and that's why the Comanche were known for kidnapping so many people. That's how they built up their numbers. Empire of the Summer Moon. That's it. That's the one I read, too. You're right. Yeah. I think, was this the book and it had the story in it about there were people in like a, somewhere in the West and they were having a like shooting contest and they had um, some Comanche people were there and they were not doing well, but then they got on horseback yeah. and they were shooting the targets as they were going by and then they were like perfect. Mm -hmm. And it was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's also interesting because anybody who knows the old classic Western novel or movie, The Searchers, mm -hmm. I think that Quana Parker's mother is the inspiration for that story. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So much to learn. It's pretty solid. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a good pick. And that was, yeah, her first pick. Yes. That's she put my one, number. two, three, four, and that was one. That was one. I don't know if they were ranked in order, but if they were, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Well, um, the first one of mine that she picked was The Long Walk by Brian Kastner. I almost picked two books called The Long Walk because there's a Stephen King book called The Long Walk <laughs> that I liked. And I was like, that would be funny. But then I was like, well, if she doesn't pick both of them, then it'll kind of ruin the joke for me. I don't know. I um, just liked the gimmick of it. I did. And I was like, because I was Googling this one, but I kept getting the other one and I had to be like, oh, yeah. I have to put the author in here. It's too bad there aren't four books called The Long Walk. You could have really just gone there. There has to be at least one more, right? Yeah. If I could have fully done, like, this is my all The Long Walk recommendation. Put all my eggs in this one basket. <laughs> it's kind of too bad she picked it because I could have done that for another one. I could be like, this time I'm recommending all books with the title The Long Walk. <laughs> well, if that happens in a future episode, everyone will know why. <laughs> or at least the people who listen to this episode will know why and everyone else will be confused. <laughs> You're right. They'll be like, what even is this show? <laughs> so The Long Walk is a memoir by a guy named Brian Kastner. He was a soldier in, um, I think, Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, he was in the Ordnance Disposal. So, you know, that's like the bomb squad mm -hmm. dealing with the IEDs and the roadside bombs and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to just read. There's a little passage in here. Um, when I deployed for the first time, my wife asked her grandmother for advice. Her grandfather served in Africa and Europe in World War II. Her grandmother would know what to do. How do I live with him being gone? How do I help him when he comes home? My wife asked. He won't come home, her grandmother answered. The war will kill him one way or the other. I hope for you that he dies while he's there. Otherwise, the war will kill him at home with you. That's grim. <sighs> yeah. 
It's a grim book. Um, I think it's a really, really good book for, you know, understanding what veterans go through. Mm -hmm. Um, I think because the Hurt Locker is like the obvious comparison, but I would say like the last, you know, 10 minutes of the Hurt Locker and everybody's talking about Jeremy Renner's like at home after being deployed and he's like in the supermarket and he's looking at the breakfast cereal and he's like, I don't even know what to do. And it's like that life doesn't make sense to him anymore. And that's a lot of what this book is focused on is like Brian Kastner coming back and trying to make sense of life, quote unquote, real normal life, Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to life in a war zone. Right. Um, I think it's for me too, it kind of fulfills that guy books idea. And I think it's like the Hurt Locker too, where that feels like a total guy movie. But then you find out more about it, and you're like, "Yeah, this has pretty universal appeal." To be honest, and like, and Catherine Bigelow is the director. Yeah, who's like, you know, the queen of making guy movies. Mm-hmm. You know, like Point Break, <laughs> which I'm like, this might be the most guy guy movie ever made, and Catherine Bigelow made it. So I don't even what that means for the category. I can't even begin to speculate. <laughs> But anyway, it's not the easiest read. It's kind of like a, it's hard. It's hard to watch someone suffering the way he is and describing what he's going through. But it's not like, to me, it didn't feel so overwhelming and mm-hmm. depressing that it's like you you can't get through it. Right. Like you, you're looking at it on the nightstand and you're like, mm, I don't want to, I don't think I want to go back there. Yeah. That's a thing I struggle with as a reader. Yeah. I, I'll put a book down and not want to pick it up. Chances are I may never go back. Yeah. Yeah. And so this one doesn't feel quite that way. And I Mm -hmm. think it does have a mix too of like physical action with how he's feeling in a way that kind of propels you through it. Okay. The other thing is it's pretty short. And so I think that helps it not feel so like oppressive. Right. Because it's like it happens, but you know, it's, um, it's like trying to wax your your nose hair or something. It's like you just yank it out, man. You say that as though that's something I'm familiar with. I'm not sure what to make of that. <laughs> I've seen a few videos. It, I have to say, it's this seems like a thing that guys try. Doesn't seem like it turns out well <laughs> most of the time. The, I mean, I can I can envision it being a sensitive area to just yank things off of. Yeah. Yeah. Not fun. And then you know that's even when it turns out at its best. They seem to universally be like, I'm never doing that again. (laughs) Not worth it. (laughs) So anyway, this is like that in that way Uh where it's fast. It's over and it's like intense. It is intense, Mm -hmm. but it's over so quickly that you don't just feel if this book were 400 pages, it would be unreadable because it'd just be too much. Right. But at its length, I think it's like around 200. Okay. It works pretty well. A short dip in a tough pool. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think this is just kind of has something for everybody. Um, And it just checks a lot of the boxes as far as like genres and things like that, that she's looking for. Okay. And I think it's kind of an underrated book in that sort of war memoir genre. Like I think a lot of the modern war genre or books haven't really gotten their due yet. Yeah. And I think this one should get a little more credit. All right. I love using um, using this opportunity to shine a light on an underappreciated book. I think it's really, yeah, yeah. really underappreciated. But um, and by the way, Brian Kastner is still like writing, seems to be doing well. Good. So I, I like when I see a book of his is coming out because I'm like, he's still fighting the good fight here. Still out there. Yeah. Yep. Good. All right. I'm ready to hear about Hench. Hench. Yeah, that, um, this was your like... Left field pick, right? This was, yeah. And it's the one she chose. Yeah. I, w- I was a little surprised to see this on the <laughs> list, but excited because I thought this book was a delight. Um, this is one of those that I think more people would enjoy if they knew about it. So again, I'm happy to be shining a bit of a light on it. So uh, I picked it even though in her request, she said she doesn't generally look at like these sci-fi fantasy kind of speculative fiction picks as a go-to genre for her. But she has read and enjoyed some of them. Mm-hmm. So I thought that I was gonna I was gonna go for it. I was gonna give it a chance, and evidently it landed, which is great. So um 
I feel like the combination of its focus on character and empathy for character and some fun action and also some thought-provoking themes might combine to be something that would appeal. So uh, like I was saying, it's a take on like superhero comics and movies, but uh, centering on the role of the villain's assistant, the evil henchman. So um, Anna is a temp agency hench woman, henchman, who mostly does light office work and, and data entry, data analysis. Uh, and her life changes when she gets injured by um, a superhero named Super Collider. Um, he is like the Superman, basically, of this world. And he just brushes past her and shatters her femur in a bunch of places, and she can't work or move for six months. So during the six months, when she's stuck uh, in a friend's apartment, uh, basically living on the couch, she starts doing some research about the damage that superheroes do in trying to like save the day. Mm -hmm. And she starts noticing that she's not the only one who has been, you know, irrevo irrevocably affected by superhero intervention. And she looks at, you know, the life years of henchmen and villains who have been <laughs> damaged by superheroes, property damage, um, citizen livelihood, like businesses that are shut down maybe indefinitely because, you know, a superhero threw a villain through the window, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So um, if if she has a, a superpower, it would be like data analysis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> her, her secret weapon is a spreadsheet. So um, she posts all of her findings on the internet and basically gets a whole lot of like sneers from people who are like, you're just a henchman and you just don't like superheroes. But a supervillain named Leviathan finds uh, her information and immediately hires her as one of his higher up full-time workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, she starts using all of her data and, and doing research and starts a marketing campaign basically against superheroes <laughs> <laughs> to try and change public perception of superheroes and expose some of their maybe reckless behavior, damaging effects of their, of their work. And so it, it's kind of looking at superheroes and, and motivation for why, why do we do what we do? And does the end justify the means? So there, there's a lot of questions about what is good, what is evil. And I don't know, it was just very interesting. She ends up becoming kind of a little bit of a superhero on her own. She becomes known by as the auditor, <laughs> <laughs> which I find endlessly delightful. Um, and by the end, you know, this satire becomes a little bit, there's a little bit of body horror in it. So just a heads up for that. Um, but who can resist an antihero who has a spreadsheet as her weapon of choice? Like, it's it's unexpected. And that's what I liked about it. I can't disagree with that. <laughs> well, I have to say... Um... Just to pull the curtain back a little, this is a, the person who filled this out we're familiar with. Yes. And uh, when I read this line for anyone who loves a spreadsheet and fighting evil, I was like, well, that's it. Because when she was like in her teens, she created a Microsoft database of the clothes she had, <laughs> mostly just to have the database, you know, not because she was like yeah. a big fashionista, but because she was like spreadsheets are her thing yeah i have to admit that <laughs> what i sent was basically the generic publisher's plot description and that sentence i added in because i knew it would catch her attention <laughs> I mean, yeah if, if you wanted to i'm i'm gonna guess that a data-based superhero is not for everybody but it is for some people yeah. and she is those people yeah <laughs> I, I was as well. I quite maybe it's the librarian in me, mm -hmm. but the idea of someone doing a bunch of research to fight, you know, to fight what she sees as a wrong in the world, I was like, this speaks to me. This was when you were describing this too. This reminded me of there's a Superman story from probably the early '80s, where Lex Luthor gets a supercomputer. This is like when everyone was like mega excited about computers right. doing stuff, yeah, but they weren't really sure what they were gonna do. <laughs> And so he, you know, gets this entire, like, the Batcave computer, just enormous. And uh, he's just feeding endless data into it about right. Superman. Because he's like, this computer will be able to figure out who Superman's alter ego is. Right. And so, you know, you're, like, waiting for the thrilling conclusion. It's like a two-part thing. And the computer is, like, calculating the whole time. And 
it's the worst story because the computer comes back and is like, Superman is Clark Kent. And Lex Luthor immediately dismisses it and dismantles the computer because he's like, Superman would never live like a normal life. This stupid thing is broken. He must be a king or, you know, he would live this like lavish lifestyle. This is obviously a piece of crap. And it made me so angry when I was a kid because I was like, you're Lex Luthor. You have unlimited resources. You don't want to just send someone by his apartment to check? Yeah. Like maybe just like. Just ask him and see, does he look surprised? What the hell? Like, why not just give it a shot? I mean, maybe you think it's highly unlikely, but then at the same time, I'm like, you got this whole computer for this specific purpose yeah. because you can't figure it out. Maybe the computer figured out something that you can't because it yeah. doesn't have this asinine idea that Superman must be like a king somewhere. Right. <laughs> anyway, that was ignoring the data. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you fool. Yeah. You fool. Yeah, this is all about the data. I like it. Yeah. It sounds kind of fun. It was delightful, and I'm looking forward to reading more from this author. I think she's written some other – she's a poet um, is her like main gig, uh, but she's written some other things superhero-related, so I, I've intended to go back and check those out as well. Nice. Yeah. Um, all right, so my last pick to uh, – I picked like all downers, I think. Yeah, what's with that? Well, I picked half downers. Say something about you as a person. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I tend to it. I tend to read either things that are outrageously goofy or downers. Yeah, I think that's actually, the that, emotion I that connect fits with, with. What I know about you. I know. I don't get it. I don't get it, and I'm me. So <laughs> no one's hey. got any hope. No shame. Um, so, dear everybody, this is the one that's lit written as a book of letters right. from this guy who's planning to end his own life. So he writes. Uh, letters to everybody in his life, you know, like some of them are kind of apologies. Some are like telling people off. Some are, you know, whatever. They're all, all over the place. Right. The but, unfinished business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're written, it's kind of an interesting way to see a book because they're not, you know, at no point in this book do you get a section where it's like, his name is Jeff. He's five feet 11. You know, right. he's blah, blah, blah. You kind of have to put all the details about this person together through the letters. Um, and I think that kind of makes for an interesting read. Yeah. Because you're, you're reading what he thinks of everybody else, but really you're also finding out what he thinks of himself. Yeah, between the lines, all the context clues. Exactly. Cool. So it's kind of like a little mystery. I think what I really like about it too is the author, Michael Kimball, I think he doesn't get enough credit because he writes in a really clear way, mm -hmm. in a really simple way, mm -hmm. so that you're never confused about what's happening. You're never confused about what the characters are thinking, but you're, you know, it's not like flowery or, um, intricate. Yeah. Like I'm trying to think of an example of somebody who writes in a way that's a lot more, uh, uh, I don't know. Decorative mm -hmm. is maybe how I'd say it. Um, but I think the thing is, like, as you're reading his book, you kind of get sucked into it because it feels like very authentic. It feels like you're hearing a real voice. So I kind of thought this one made me feel like the same way I felt when I read uh, Tell the Wolves I'm Home because mm -hmm. it feels super intimate with like one or two people. Um, and it's like a really tiny world. It's not like a the whole world is involved. Yeah. It's not like an issue in the world. It's like really, really laser focused on one person. Right. And um, that just, I found that a really satisfying experience. And I think part of what I found satisfying about Tell, Tell the Wolves I'm Home was felt similar to this. Yeah. As a side note, Tell the Wolves I'm Home is a lovely book that not enough people know about. It's really great. Yeah. It's a really good one. That one I think is like the opposite where I'm like, this doesn't strike me as a guy book. It kind of strikes me closer to the other side of things, but I loved it. Yeah. And like, you know, I don't always love books that are less like guy books, I guess, but yeah. I was like, I'm into it. <laughs> it was, it was lovely. Emotional, yeah. but so good. It very emotional. Yeah. But so really, really good. Really and it good. really like pushes you through and stuff. And that's part of what I like about this dear everybody too, is cause it's letters. They're all pretty short. Mm -hmm. You can kind of – you can sit and read it for five minutes or you can just sit and read through the whole thing. Okay. And it doesn't feel like sometimes when a book has a format like that, 
if you sit and read through the whole thing, it feels like a diminishing return. Like you kind of have, it's like, I compare it to reading the onion where it's like, I'll read a headline and I laugh. And then I read another one and I laugh. But then when I read like 10, yeah, they're just kind of all flat. Mm-hmm. And I just, I'm like, oh, I guess I used up my funny for the day. <laughs> like yeah. My enjoyment of humor for the day. <laughs> yeah. So this doesn't work like that. This okay. is not that. <laughs> so you could read it all the way through, but you totally. very easily don't have to. Yep. Cool. And it's like really easy to pick up and put down. So that can be a mixed bag, but I think it would be a, a good thing for this reader. All right. So yeah. Boom. Yeah. Well, I guess we already briefly described our others. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about your other two picks? Uh, just that I think Leonard and Hungry Paul specifically is a unique little book that I think not enough people are going to find. It's kind of under the radar. And if uh, the idea of very everyday kind of awkward people living their lives and just being good people sounds like something that that would be appealing, I, I wish more people would read it. I think it, it was a charming kind of unusual book. Yeah. Okay. I'll just say a little bit about The Meadow as well. The other thing I was going to say about that is maybe uh, if you have like the person in your family, like I'm picturing an old guy. Um, who's doesn't read a lot, but you know, is maybe like his favorite book is uh, Lonesome Dove or something mm-hmm. like that. This is a great pick for that person. Okay, those people can be kind of hard to find books for, mm-hmm. but this would be a great book for that person because I think I think that person would enjoy it, but I think almost any reader would enjoy it too. So you could both read it and probably talk about it and find things in common around it. So I like the idea, right? Right now, a book that unites people. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like yeah. it could be a good thing. Yeah, that would be nice. Maybe another way to put that, if you think there may be an awkward holiday coming up in the near future, and mm. Grandpa's coming, and you guys tend to fight about something at the table, maybe send Grandpa some homework, and you can yeah. do some homework. And if you read this book, then if things start getting intense... Yeah, holiday book club. So how about that meadow, huh? <laughs> <laughs> This is a uh, just a suggestion from, you know, library yeah. staff. Of, Librarian tips yep. for, for calmer holidays. Smooth out those holiday yeah. dinners. <laughs> whatever, whatever side of things you're on, <laughs> this is a highly recommended method of making it work. <laughs> yeah. All right. Do you want to just go back through real quick and tell us your titles and authors? And- yeah, absolutely. I'll also say um, I made note because she did ask for ebooks or audio ebooks primarily. So mm-hmm. I'll make note of which ones are available as ebooks, et cetera. Yeah, when you get the recommendation back, it's really cool because it'll, you'll have links in it that yeah. take you straight to it. So you can put it on hold, or if it's electronic, you can sometimes check it yeah. out right then. It'll take you to actually all the formats on the catalog. So you can go through and just pick the one that you want. Uh, if you thought you wanted audio and then you're like, actually, I'm going to need an ebook, you can do that. Um, yeah. So my first title was Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth by Sarah Smarsh. And that is available as an ebook. Uh, it's also available in print and some other formats. I just made note of ebook because that was primarily what she was looking for. My second title, which we discussed a little bit more in detail, was Savage Country by Robert Olmsted, which is available as an ebook. Then my third is Leonard and Hungry Paul by Ronan Hessian. That one we only have in regular print, unfortunately, but it was unique enough that I definitely wanted to include it. And finally, we have Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots. That is available as an ebook, and that is my spreadsheet superhero title. All right, and I've got The Long Walk by Brian Kastner. That's the uh, war memoir. The Meadow by James Galvin. Um, that's about tie siding Wyoming. I've got The Call by Yannick Murphy. So Y-A-N-N-I-C-K Murphy. Mm-hmm. Murphy. <laughs> and we'll have all of this in the, in the notes <laughs> as well, the podcast description if you need spellings. And then uh, Dear Everybody by Michael Kimball. Um, we have some other Michael Kimball books too, and they're all excellent in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, we could do it another time. I'll just do a ranking, a <laughs> power ranking of Michael Kimball books. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Is there anything else you want people to know about PRLs or? Um, 
I guess I'll just say that anybody who's thinking about doing this, I'll let you know what to expect, which is a little bit of a wait because we do actually do some research to try and find real matches. That We don't just pick something at random. We do read lots of reviews and we pull suggestions from all library staff. So you're not going to get some one random person who's trying to match your taste. We have dozens of people looking at these and hopefully at least one of them will have reading tastes similar to yours. So you will be getting matches from real people who do some research and are trying to match you specifically uh, and not just the book, but why you liked it, trying to find something that will hit those same buttons. So um, this is something that I think we as library workers do particularly well and whatever we send you, you don't have to worry if we just bought too many copies and are trying to offload them because we're not (laughs) trying to sell you anything. No. Yeah, I was going to mention, I have seen similar versions to what we offer, but for pay mm-hmm. um, from, you know, various commercial book sites and publishers even mm-hmm. and stuff like that. A couple and, of blogs, I think. Yeah. And boy, even if you're listening to this and you're not in our service area or whatever, yeah. like look online because your library probably has it. I well, looked up and in so many cities do. To be honest, we have filled out these requests for people who don't even live in the United States. Right. So if you're listening to this and you don't live in our service area, um, you, we can't guarantee that the books we recommend will be in your library's system, but we will still send you a list. Yeah. Yep. It's a, you know, it's public service, yeah. right? So, you know, uh, don't pay for one. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't pay for it. <laughs> Or, you know, unless you're just so hardcore that you're like, I want to try all the recommendation services and you've got the money to burn. Yeah. But we're also not going to charge you. So feel free. I mean, you know, if the kind of billionaire goes to space in a rocket ship and you want to burn 15 bucks on some book recommendations. All right. (laughs) (laughs) You know, um, I can also do more than one. We ask you to do one at a time, but if you get one and we're not quite right or you want to try something different, you can send in a second and we're happy to do it for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to say too is like, it can be a really good way if you want to, you know, if someone that you buy gifts for is a reader Mm -hmm. and you want to figure out like, oh, I want something unusual that they don't have. Or if you're like a parent and you're like, I don't know what to what to give my kid. Like my kid has, uh, you know, sometimes in the library we come across a kid who has a very high reading level, but the interest level is still at the kid level. Mm -hmm. And so that can be a challenge. Things like that. Um, PRL works really well for that. School assignments. Sometimes if if kids have to read like historical fiction, but you'd rather find them something they'll actually enjoy rather than something that's just going to be a trial. Yep. We can try to help with that. Yeah. The only other thing I was going to say is to access it. By the time this goes live, I'll make mylibrary.us slash PRL will go straight to the form. To get to it organically, if you go to our web- website, mylibrary.us, there's a tab at the top that says services, and there you'll find all of our services listed there, including personalized reading lists. And that's just all alphabetical, no problem. So you can go to it either way. Um, or if you if you stop in a, one of our libraries, there's a paper version too. Absolutely. So you can fill it out on paper if computer is just not your thing. Yeah. All right. We did it. Uh, well, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone, yeah. for listening again. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing you again next month. Yeah. I know, this is, by the way, our first in-person recording of this. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Pretty exciting. We've met before, but we've also <laughs> only been recording since, you know – work from home weird times yep yeah so hopefully that this will continue to be an in-person gig yeah and uh it's nice to see another human face i know i know like the whole face too i know (laughs) it's odd there's a whole there's a whole half of the face of most people that i have not seen i know (laughs) all right we'll talk to you all next time all right bye